Oh, so uh, we're not going to talk about the exam. I, I don't ask me any questions about it uh, in my office until I grade it, OK? And so I plan to have that done by Thursday to get back to you on, well, to, yeah, to get back to you on Thursday. Did everybody, I assume everybody was able to upload a, at least a, something to the uh, drive that I can grade, OK? Um, but my question was, so the, I told you I'm not going to say anything about it, but I am going to have to say something about the second problem. Uh, you have to understand that when I make up these problems, uh, the idea is to uh, give a problem that I think everybody should be able to get. That was the first problem. You know, after us talking about index notation and so forth, I thought that would kind of ease you into it. Being, some of you are taking 52, 27, and so forth. The second problem, the first part of the second problem, which I don't remember what I asked you to do, but the first part was fairly straightforward. The second part was a little bit more challenging, intentionally. I mean, you know, the, the, the intention is to always at least have something at least challenging enough to see that, just, you know, see what, just, what are you understanding? The last one was pretty much uh, a repeat of uh, the uh, example problem, you know, with the jet, but it was turned vertically. And uh, you two, uh, I do have an answer for, for your question, because you were asking me a question. Remember last week you were asking me a question about um, the example problem, about what comes through the side? I can't really, I don't think I can uh, explain it more broadly, but I can if you come to my office afterwards, we can, we can talk about it. So, um, so yeah, so I thought that, uh, I was going to ask you some conceptual questions, but I thought, you know, I'll do that on the next exam. <clears throat> I really wanted to have you spend your time on, on some of the uh, uh, problems like I gave. So I assume you have plenty of time, right? OK. You're all very quiet about the exam. So uh, but based on the questions I was getting, I think, I think everybody was at least uh, uh, appeared, uh, from what I could tell everybody, most people were un understanding the exam of what was being asked. So we went over these things right here. So, uh, oh, let, let me, let's get back up to speed as to where we are in the class. We are behind and uh, have gotten a little bit further behind. Uh, where are you on your uh, write-ups for your project? Is, is there anybody who is not able to do the integration? The example I, if, hopefully the example I gave, I knew someone we were having some trouble, but the example I gave you, which is the three-body problem, which is another, I take these examples. There's a lot of overlap between this class and 5227. But that was an, a problem I gave uh, given uh, 5227. And there's an example of how to do a uh, uh, vector integration. Yes. Uh, you, you have said that you want it in 3D, correct? Or is it just, because I, I keep hearing you say 3D and then some people, a lot, most of the people I know have been doing it in 2D because it's kind of hard to plot it in 3D and for it to be obvious of what's happening. That's up to you. Okay. It's a, uh, those storms are three-dimensional storms. Uh, as far as plotting, I think I mentioned that if you, if you stay in the plane that includes the axis of the uh, jet, I would not expect it to be more than a two-dimensional, yeah. more than two-dimensional motion. But if you release off-center, where your initial vector is not pointing through the, the axis, I would expect it to not be. I expect it to have some 3D motion. So again, it's up to you to, to explore. Uh, I don't want to constrain you on this. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm encouraging you to explore it and see what you find out and what's, what's reasonable. Part of a problem like this is figuring out what to present. You know, I mean, when you write a paper, there's, there's usually, the only template you have is basically the, uh, you know, to format it. Other than that, the journals are not going to tell you what to write, okay? So, uh, and neither, if you're working on a PhD, neither is your, is your, uh, your advisor is not going to tell you what to write. Because when you're working on a PhD, you are creating <coughs> new knowledge. So you will be the world's expert on some topic. 
uh, and that, that is that's the purpose of the, if you're not the world's expert on a topic, by the time you create, uh, finish your dissertation, then you shouldn't get a PhD degree. Seriously, I mean, that's, that's the goal of, of doing a PhD. Uh, I mean, it may be useful or not useful in terms of uh, what you actually are the expert in. <laughs> I've met plenty of people who are expert in stuff that's just totally useless. Uh, I like to think I'm not one of them, but I'm not going <clears> to <throat> presume too much. Um, let's just say that after I, my, my uh, PhD thesis was focused on uh, minimum length nozzles that can be used for isotope separation, among other things. And let's just say after my dissertation was published, I got a lot of emails from Cuba and some other places that kind of took me by surprise. But then when I, when I thought about it, it wasn't surprising. <coughs> All right. Any other? Oh, I, we're going to talk about where we are in the class. Let's, uh, before we get into this quiz, let's just pop out real quick and see if I can bring some, uh, get us back on schedule here uh, in the next uh, week. So your home, you have homework due Thursday, correct? What's that? <laughs> no. <laughs> why, 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 do you have a lot of grading to do? <laughs> I, okay. No, we can't, we can't put, uh, we can't put off the, home. I, I will, we'll work a problem today. And it may be the problem that gets graded. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what am I looking for? Uh, syllabus and schedule. Schedule. Have, have we worked a problem that was graded? I think once. Yeah. And then la the, the homework that's due, oh, one of the problems, was it this homework that's due upcoming that I said we're not going to grade one of the problems? Oh, is it the last one? Oh, that was the JET problem, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 419, 440, 462, and 477 are due. We're about a week behind schedule now, and um, so I need to work on getting this back on schedule. So uh, frankly, there's too much, there's too much uh, covered in this class, too many topics. And uh, I'm going to talk to my colleagues about reducing some of that content, because we need to, we need to dwell on some of this stuff for a little bit. Yes? Yes. I originally had two projects. Uh, <laughs> no, I, it's just I, I haven't assigned it yet. We'll, we'll talk about it after the first one. I, I, don't even want, I didn't want to even bring it up until you turn the first one in. Okay, and we'll do it similar, similar to the, the first one. But it'll give us some, uh, some incentive. It, it, maybe we'll look at uh, hypersonic boundary layers because I'm working on a proposal right now. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to give you real stuff. Seriously, we're working on a proposal right now to, um, it's an AFOSR, that's Air Force Office of Scientific Research. And this is uh, probably somewhat related to what I was just telling you about hypersonics. It's a, the Air Force is interested in characterizing the uh, stratosphere above 80,000 feet. And so they are interested in uh, the turbulence levels and the particulates that might exist in the atmosphere at those altitudes. And so two things that they're interested in, uh, well, they're interested in, in, in uh, hypersonic vehicles flying at, at, in, in those conditions and what the turbulence and the uh, particulate matter might do to the stability of the boundary layer. Because if you, uh, if you have a, a turbulent boundary layer at those, at those speeds, the heat transfer can be so much, you, you know, just you can't deal with it. And um, so the current designs are focused on maintaining a laminar boundary layer. Um, the other part of it is uh, associated with the propagation of, uh, of optical propagation. And we don't know when these types of... Uh, proposal opportunities are, are given in the research as public research, 
there's usually some underlying interest in what, you know, what the application might be, but, uh, and we don't really know exactly what that is, but the, the uh, you know, there's laser communications and things like that uh, that uh, uh, would be affected by turbulence in the, in the, in the stratosphere. So uh, what I'm thinking is, uh, and since we're, we're working on a collaborative proposal with University of Minnesota, uh, and uh, Embry-Riddle University on that project, and it involves balloons also. Uh, and uh, as a way of making measurements in the, in, in the uh, because we're proposing mm -hmm. to directly do some measurements. So what I was thinking of is uh, to give us motivation uh, in the second half of the class is to, as a boundary layer focused uh, project. How does that sound? Intriguing? Hypersonic boundary layer. See, in a hypersonic boundary layer, some of those terms that we, uh, that you might ignore in the Navier-Stokes equation, you might not be able to ignore them. And especially, maybe we'll do Mars, because especially in a Martian atmosphere, you cannot ignore, even though most of the calculations that I'm, I'm uh, familiar with that people have done in the past, looking at uh, vehicles entering the Martian atmosphere, they ignore uh, they, they assume Stokes' hypothesis, which, let's get to that. And uh, uh, we, my former advisor and I wrote a paper years ago questioning whether that was uh, the validity of that assumption in a carbon dioxide uh, atmosphere. And I'll say more about that in just a second when we look at the quiz. So, uh, homework is still due on Thursday. The, I'll create a Dropbox for your reports. I think I said in the report, uh, oh, Mr. Matthew, that's what I'm missing. He sent me an email. He's, I don't make it today. sorry, I just knew somebody was missing. Uh, so uh, five pages, you understand what I'm saying about the five pages? Five pages of text, you can have an appendix. Your appendix might be significantly longer. Uh, but five pages of the main uh, report. You do need to turn in a PDF of, well, please do your report and uh, turn it in in PDF format. And part of your appendix should be your, uh, any code that you've written because I do look at how you've organized. I have a part of the rubric that's designed to encourage you to be good programmers in the sense of documenting your code and so forth. That, that should be a no-brainer part. That part, you should knock that out. That's automatically satisfied points there, you know, right there. You, shouldn't even, you, shouldn't lo you should not lose points on that part. Yes? Uh, does this mean you need like, uh, a semi or, or we need to create a different Say that again? Oh, do you, no, no, you don't need an operational manual. I'm not going to run your code. Yeah, but like, like there in a uh, rubric is documentation of code? Yes, documentation. Just comments of code? No, it just means that in your code that you have comment statements that say what you're doing. Okay. Okay. It's, it's actually for your benefit because uh, uh, the, the, the <coughs> idea is to get in the habit of do documenting your code such that when you look at it a month later, you remember what you did because if you don't, you won't remember. At least I don't. I can write a code and I can go back, you know, if I don't document it very well, about a month's time I go back and look at it and I'm, I'm struggling to re recall what it, why I did things a certain way. All right, so you need to get in a good ha in a habit of doing that. And also because of legacy, uh, you know, um, uh, you need to be able to write code so that someone else who may be paid to look at your code, that happened a lot with Fortran. Uh, back in the uh, 80s and 90s when there was, you know, moving Fortran to C, uh, C++, things like that. Uh, you go back and look at some of the Fortran codes and, and people, it, it was just horrendous, you know, trying to figure out what people were trying to do because the codes were not well documented. They were spaghetti because you had these things like go-to. You probably heard of go-to statements and things like that. Crazy statements like that that are now <laughs> obsolete. So that's what that part is for. Any other questions about the project? So get that wrapped up. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm not so much looking forward to grading your exam, but I am looking forward to reading your reports. 
I don't, I don't like graded exams at all. In fact, if it's my, my choice, I wouldn't even have exams. Okay, what? Where, I, I wait for the, well, who's, Mr. Starnes, are you the one going to say, well, why do you have exams? <laughs> I was counting on Mr. Starnes to be the one to say that. You were just about to say it, weren't you? I did say it. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to the, uh, let's finish this quiz um, preview. And there's just a few things I wanted to cover today, and I keep saying I'm going to let you out early. Did I let you out early on the previous time? This today I will, if if it goes uh, as it should. So let's start with the uh, question: uh, Where do we leave off? <coughs> Number four. Um, let's go back and see what number three was. Three. The tensor is isent. Oh, okay. That was Ms. Uh, I read isotropic. Yeah. But it's it's not. It's right. Not. Yeah, you had you had it right. It, it was I was tricking you. Yeah, it was obviously a question. Yeah, it was just a, me playing a trick on you, trying to play a trick on you. Well, let me ask you. Oh, this leads up to another one though. Right here, number five. Then we'll go back to number four. So, uh, this Durinia. The stress on the static fluid is given by that, right? So, what about the off diagonal terms in the stress tensor in this case? There are none, right? Because the delta ij is the, basically the identity matrix. If you write it as a matrix, it's, it's the identity matrix, right? And so this basically means that there's only diagonal terms. Uh, the off-diagonal terms are zero. So in this case, that P is the thermodynamic pressure. Everybody agree with that? Sure. OK. Now, now, the, uh, now you have a moving fluid. And so now, in addition to, so once the fluid it is viscous, um, and this is sometimes referred to as the viscous stress tensor, you know, the deviatory stress tensor, the viscous stress tensor. Uh, so a moving fluid causes you to get these additional stresses here. So now the stress tensor, remember this is the whole point of this chapter, well this part of the chapter, is to develop this relationship that allows us to write the stress tensor in terms of of uh, basically the velocity on the other side here, okay? And so now, with the fluid now in motion, the pressure P can no longer be assumed to represent the thermodynamic pressure unless we assume local thermodynamic equilibrium. We have to make that assumption in order for this to, to hold? What if it doesn't hold? Does that, does that mean that this, uh, the way we've written this is incorrect? So we have to determine the difference between neutral and thermodynamic pressure. That's right. Okay. So it doesn't mean that it's, it's in, uh, incorrect. It just means that we can no longer identify this as the thermodynamic uh, pressure, which means then that if we can't do that, then it, prevents, it presents a problem because we can't use our simple equation of state uh, that relates the pressure, temperature, and uh, density, right? So, but it doesn't mean that we, we, we can't deal with it. So, you got a long one here, so I'm not through with you yet. So, in the general case with fluid motion, a mean pressure can be defined, like you see right here. So what, is that, what does that mean? What, uh, uh, this is the average of the sum, because that repeated index means sum, 
So this is T11 plus T22 plus T33 divided by 3. Yep. So it's the mean of the diagonal terms. Okay? And those diagonal stresses are obviously are the normal components uh, that the dilatational components are associated with the, not the shear, but the, um, the dilatational stresses, correct? So that is the average of the diagonal term of stress tensor TIJ such that we have this relationship right here. And by the way, like I said, if I'm, if I'm writing these equations out, that means that I'm assuming I'm writing them correctly. <coughs> so I'm not, the question is not about the equation. The question is about what I'm asking about the equation. So we can write this. Now, this part right here is, is what? And so the divergence, is it associated with some of the off-diagonal terms? Do they contribute to the divergence? Mr. Starnes is saying no. You're saying no. Mr. Watson, what are you saying? To the, that this computation right here involves the off-diagonal terms of the velocity or the, uh, in this case, the pressure tensor. No, this, this is just a divergence, so it's just associated with the, the dilatation again, right? So this is a dilatational term right here. And so basically what this is, this is called the first coefficient of viscosity, and this is the second coefficient of viscosity. And uh, this is what came about, remember we started off with 81, you know, you reduce this down to four constants and, uh, or four uh, parameters and then further reduce that down. You get down to something that looks like this. So the difference between the thermodynamic pressure and the mean of mechanical, the, uh, the mean pressure is also referred to as mechanical pressure. The difference between those two is this thing right here multiplying the divergence. So either, if this is zero, what kind of flow do we have? Uh, Mr. Uh, trying to uh, remind me your last name. Uh, Wagner. Mr. Wagner. I need to ask you more questions. I only get to you about once every six or seven lecture. So Mr. Wagner, um, if we have del dot u is equal to zero, what type of flow is that associated with? Constant density? Yeah, yeah, constant density and uh, compressible flow. Are those the same thing? Uh, no, one is a subset of the other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How can you have a incompressible flow that's not constant density? Do you know Mr. Dotty sitting next to you? You, you do or you don't know him? Oh, uh, no, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, no. No? I don't. Oh, okay. Well, you do now. Yeah. You want him to help you? Sure. Help him out, Mr. Dottie. What do you think? Uh, it is possible uh, to have a constant density in composite, uh, varying density in composite flow. Give me an example. Uh, where I can give you an equation, okay. probably. Where no, I said, no, I don't want an equation. I want an example. Like, uh, like the ocean, right? Water's yeah. Like because keep in mind, this is a point-wise. When we write the differential form, we're talking about at a point. So that means that at a point, or you know, um, or along as well, at a point, the flow is is incompressible, yeah. right? But it doesn't mean that if you go point from point to point, for instance, vertically, yeah. you can have a different density. But it's still incompressible. Yeah. So it just means that the volume in which you have mass that the amount of mass in that volume is constant, right, at that, at that point. If you go to another point, this is a Larian description, if you go to another point, the volume in that mass, I mean the mass in that volume is constant, but it doesn't have to be the same as, as it was somewhere else. There's no dilatation. Yeah. Okay. All right, so now back to my question. 
The other case that we could have these two equal is what? So either this is equal to zero, or what? Or else, uh, <clears throat> well, or else that uh, t thirds term over there cancels out. Zero. Yes, so <laughs> that's what I wrote right here, right? <clears throat> so this is Stokes' hypothesis or Stokes' assumption that lambda equals a, uh, equals a minus two-thirds mu. And for error under virtually any condition, this is pretty much true. But you can show, and we'll, we'll look at the, when we write the Navier Stokes equations, and they, they actually write it explicitly. There's something called bulk viscosity uh, that we'll look at here in just a second that if the bulk viscosity is not zero, then this is not satisfied, and you cannot make the assumption that the, these two pressures are, are the same. And so that means that in, where it makes a difference is if this is not zero, uh, this, if this is significant, and you know, if you have a highly dilatational flow, then that is what will cause your mechanical pressure and your to differ from your thermodynamic pressure. And you can get those types of flows, for instance, in a hypersonic boundary layer. Okay, and, and you also, what happens here also is you get this sort of a relaxation effect. In other words, you can, if you disturb the, um, if you, uh, we haven't talked about this, but in a real gas, like uh, that has structure, the molecules have structure like <clears throat> diatomic oxygen, CO2, or whatever. If the flow goes through something like a shock wave where it's suddenly taken out of equilibrium, it takes it some time to return to equilibrium, okay? And so that time it takes the gas to return to equilibrium is called a relaxation. So as an example, if you look at If you look, if this is a shock wave, and you have flow coming into the shock wave at some high Mach number, then downstream of the shock wave, the Mach number is always going to be less than one. That's right, if it's, this is a normal shock. So no matter how fast it's going upstream, it will decelerate to where it's less than one downstream. Now what happens is, if you looked at the, um, the gas as it comes in, the temperature, for instance, will go through a, if this is the temperature T1, it'll go through a jump, okay? But what happens is, there are different modes, you know, we talked about energy, well, we, we'll get into the energy equation, but we talked about the different modes of energy. Uh, there's a mode of energy associated with the, with the uh, translation of the molecules, a kinetic mode. That's the one we generally think of. And, and, um, but there's also an energy associated with the vibrational mode. When, when, the, when the gas goes through here, if it's a diatomic molecule, for instance, it might, if it's modeled like this where you have two atoms with a spring between them, and so it's doing this, and so as it goes through the shock wave, they come out really getting after it. And some of them will even break where you dissociate the molecules, depending on how fast you're going, okay? And that's actually a good thing, because that actually lowers the temperature that a heat shield has to deal with, for instance, in re-entering the atmosphere, is because it's not a perfect gas. If it were a perfect gas, it would be horrendous temperatures. But because it's not an ideal ga or perfect gas, some of the energy of the motion goes into vibrational energy. Some of it goes into rotational, because this, this, this will spin around an axis like this, okay? But what happens is all these modes we're talking about now, and there's also the mode of if you're really going fast, the electron cloud around the uh, atoms will, will expand and contract depending on, will expand if you're at high enough temperatures. So energy actually goes into puffing up the atom as well as all these other things. So you come out of this side, and you know, we, we oftentimes will represent a shock wave as a, as a discontinuity. Actually what happens is, as you come downstream, you will see the various part, um, actually, the, as it comes out the other side, 
you'll see something like this where these different modes will, will relax to some downstream temperature, but they do so at different rates. And the, and the way they do this is by colliding with each other, okay? And so um, what, what happens then is that the uh, vibrational mode will gradually re return to the downstream equilibrium temperature, the rotational and the translational. Well, you know, the translational does it fastest, then the rotational, then the vibrational. What this bulk viscosity that we're going to talk about here in just a second is associated <coughs> with is uh, it's been theorized to be associated with the um, relaxation of, of these modes to, uh, and so what, it provides some resistance in the flow similar to what the, uh, the uh, regular uh, visco dispersive viscosity term does. And like I said, it's usually only important in high speed flows or flows that have complex molecules that have a lot of internal modes. Everybody stand up. So this one, Mr. Wagner, is, he says it's true. Anybody disagree with Mr. Wagner? OK, so Stokes' hypothesis means that, the, that we can assume that the uh, thermal or the thermodynamic pressure is the same as the mechanical pressure the mean of the mechanical, uh, that mean pressure, which is the mechanical pressure, right? And that just means then that the, um, uh, like we said, that uh, that term in parentheses is equal to zero. So I agree with Mr. Uh, Wagner. Before you sit down, because some of you are really, I thought I was talking about something exciting, but evidently it wasn't. <laughs> so if I were talking about the exam, I'd, I'd probably have all your full attention, right? You know, I, I'm sorry. It's, it's it's just so easy for me to make jokes about the exam now because I'm, <laughs> like I said, I'm on this side of it. I was on your side once. All right. So I'm going to keep you standing through this one because some of you need some serious standing. Uh, without Stokes' assumption, the stress tensor is written like this. So this is the correct way of writing it. This is that um, bulk viscosity term I was just talking about. Okay. And you don't usually see that. You know, you might in your undergraduate. Uh, of course, you probably never saw this, because at the undergraduate level, you usually just assume Stokes' hypothesis. But if you're going to be doing simulations of Martian entry, which is what I just told you, uh, some of you will get jobs looking at the first missions to Mars, uh, with people going to Mars. I don't agree with it, <laughs> but that's, that's me. All right. so. Without Stokes' assumption, the stress tensor is written like this. In this case, uh, Mr. Fox, where the stress tensor is written as a linear function of the rate of strain tensor, the fluid is called Newtonian. Yeah. Is that right? Where if I writ is this written with the stress, the rate of strain uh, tensor? with this written as a linear function of the rate of strain tensor? Does that look like that to you? You all can sit down anytime you'd like now, except for Mr. Fox. <laughs> what do you think, Mr. Fox? <laughs> Looks linear to you? Looks linear to me, too. So it is, that's, that is a, uh, this is Newtonian. So this is the basis of the Navier-Stokes equation. This is what makes the Navier-Stokes equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, which we'll <coughs> see here in just a second, is this relation right here, that we're able to write the stress tensor as, this, well, this part right here is a linear function of the rate of strain tensor, okay? Then you've got that pressure term there and this, this bulk viscosity term here that usually is zero. Okay. Otherwise, the fluid is non-Newtonian. A viscoelastic, and you asked me about this last week, and I think I gave you the wrong answer. I don't recall what I said, but I don't think it was right. 
So, uh, Mr. Gupta has to answer this last part here because I told him something wrong. A viscoelastic substance is an example of a non-Newtonian substance that has properties of Henry. Can you see that? I, I, I can. All right. Thank you. This thing isn't working anyway, so. Uh, is an example of a non-Newtonian substance that has properties that can resemble both a fluid and a solid. Last part is correct of the statement that, it, uh, that a viscoelastic substance exists. Okay, but do you think this statement is true then? Anybody disagree? No, it's, 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 it's correct. So what about a glass? You ever gone into an old house and looked at the, you probably don't see this much anymore, but looked at uh, the, paint, the window panes uh, of a really old house, you ever notice that the bottom is much thicker than the top? That's because glass is a viscoelastic material that it actually flows and that gravity over a period of years, gravity will cause that glass to flow such that the window pane will be bigger at the bottom than at the top. Just because of that very slow creep, okay? That is an example of a viscoelastic. Uh, I'll, I'll have to bring in some cornstarch on uh, Thursday, and we can do the cornstarch experiment where you stick your finger in it. And uh, I'll probably have to have you do a disclaimer in case you jam your finger or something. <laughs> These days, these students want to sue on every, about everything. So uh, this one is true. Oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> true. The Navier-Stokes momentum equation, Mr. Uh, you got to pronounce it for me. Sherbrani. Say it again. Sherbrani. Sher Sherbrani. I'm sorry that I'm off my game today with the names. So th this is the Navier-Stokes the Mo Navier momentum equation. This is a representation of which law of Newton's laws of motion? Mm -hmm. This is related to Newton's law of motion, whether it looks like it or not. Oh, is it the second law? Yeah, second law, right. It kind of looks like it. If you, if you look at this term right here, you see this is basically the, the mass per unit volume times the uh, acceleration. And then you have this other stuff here associated with the, essentially the convective derivative. Um, you have a pressure gradient. This is a body force. It's, even though it's written as G, it doesn't necessarily mean it's just gravity. It could be something else. And then you have this part right here that is related to what type of force? Yes, it's a viscous force right here. So the inclusion of the second order tensor terms means that this represents nine equations, nine, oh, <laughs> nine, I meant to say nine scalar equations, three in each coordinate direction. Is that right? No, I just mean that, that written in this subscript notation, this is actually nine separate, uh, separate equations. How about six? I think it's kind of diagonal along to zero. So you're saying six or three? Who says six? He's right, it's three. So this is wrong. You have one in each coordinate direction. So good job, I couldn't talk you out of it. So the un unknowns in this are the density, the pressure, three velocity components, right? This represents three velocity components. And then the viscosity and the bulk viscosity. So if we were to write a system of equations, we would need to have, is that, is that correct? Uh, M up to the above, then three velocity components. You're, you're not or you are? OK. Uh, I doubt there was velocity ones. What do you think, Mr. Duty?
What did you say? Just three velocity components. Yep, three velocity components and two thermodynamic variables. So actually, we don't usually include these two as the unknowns. We have to have, we have separate, they generally are functions of uh, temperature. Well, we don't really call it an equation of state. Um, it's a, uh, <clears throat> a relation for the viscosity. It's usually a function of temperature. Okay. It can be a function of temperature and pressure. I mean, because uh, uh, you can't have, depending on what kind of conditions uh, you're under, but usually this is written. What do we know about the viscosity of a, of a gas? Uh, who wants to volunteer? What do we know about the, how, how, does it, how does the viscosity of a gas go with uh, temperature? It increases in temperature. As the temperature increases, less gas is there. What about a fluid, uh, a liquid? It decreases in temperature. Does that make sense? They're both fluids. And you're saying that one of them increases with temperature and the other decreases with temperature? I, we, we played the same game uh, like the first week of class, right? Yeah, you're right. So for a liquid, the viscosity will generally decrease and, uh, with temperature. And for a gas, it increases with, with temperature. Because remember, viscosity is associated with momentum transport. OK? So this is false because couple of things. It's not nine equations, it's three. And you don't count the mu and the bulk viscosity as uh, the, uh, these are relations that you have to also provide to solve the system of equations. All right. Yes, sir. Well, you have conservation of mass. You have conservation of energy. And then you have two state equations. Well, assuming that you have relations for those viscosity terms, you'll have two state equations. One is a thermal state equation that relates the pressure, temperature, and density. And I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about incompressible. I'm talking the most general case. Because if it's incompressible, that reduces some of the unknowns. Uh, and then you have to have a caloric equation of state and the caloric equation of state basically relates the internal energy to the, uh, to the temperature, okay? So, and we haven't, even, we haven't talked about energy yet, and so uh, that's the last, well, well, we talked about energy briefly, uh, but we have not dissected energy the way we're dissecting the uh, momentum. So, uh, does that answer, Mr. Pointer? So, why we're on the subject, Mr. Pointer? <laughs> So because the mass conservation continuity equation is, uh, is a scalar equation, is that, first of all, is that statement true? What, I, what, what do I mean by a scalar equation? As compared to, so let me finish this. Uh, so I'm saying this is a scalar equation, and I'm saying that this is a vector equation. Mr. Uh, you got to pronounce it. Shervani just said, right? Didn't you say this is a vector equation? <laughs> yeah, I am putting words in your mouth. If I were to write this in in invariant form, it would I'd write it with bold. But I'd also have bold bold uh, uh, terms in that top one. And you just said it's a I, I could write that as, I could write partial rho, partial T plus del dot. Right? Is that a vector equation? No, it's a scalar equation. Uh, That's right. It is a scalar equation. So this is moving on, changing subject to non-inertial coordinate frames. This is part of the reading in chapter uh, four. <clears throat> and so the fact that, as Mr. Pointer points out, 
that this is a scalar equation means that uh, <coughs> there are, when we write it, the equations are unmodified relative to a non-inertial frame. But what about this equation? Mr. Shervani, I was trying to give him credit, but he wouldn't take credit for saying the right thing. Uh, this is a vector equation, right? It has three components, or three, three components that go with the, in this case, goes with the, uh, the J. And uh, this is a vector equation, and we know that when we write vectors in different coordinates systems, the components will change. And so, uh, and if, especially if we have a situation where the coordinate system is not inertial, meaning that it's moving or rotating, uh, and or rotating, uh, then it affects this equation. So it doesn't stay this simple. We have to, it has to be modified because it, it is a vector equation. What about the uh, energy equation looking forward? What's going to happen there? Is, that a, is the energy equation a vector equation or is it a scalar equation? It's a scalar equation, right? It's the first law. It's a representation of the first law of thermodynamics for a flow system. That's what we're going to be looking at in this case, OK? So this is um, true. Now, let's keep going here talking about this. So this diagram right here is out of the text. And uh, just to let you know, you might notice that you, you probably can't tell this, but I actually, this is an image. This is not me building the equation from LaTeX. I decided after the second time that I did this in LaTeX, and then I accidentally hit the, because when I, if, if you ever use equation editor in, in Microsoft, uh, or math, uh, math type in Microsoft Word, when you compose an equation in the box, you hit the X, you know, to, and it automatically up inserts it. That doesn't work here. And I'm in such a habit of hitting the X. That probably took 10 minutes to type that out in LaTeX. And I was thinking about the next problem, and I hit the X. I did that twice. I said, I'm not typing anymore. I'm going to start copying these equations out of, the, out of the text as an image and just insert them. So uh, I don't know why it took me so long to figure that out. But I did. So back to this. It's just a little sidebar. So the relationship between the flu uh, velocity of a fluid particle in, the, in an inertial stationary frame, unprimed in this case, this is the inertial frame, and a non-inertial frame. So this frame is not only translating, it's rotating as it's translating. So it's a vector triad. So that means this is the simplest case where you have two orthonormal coordinate frames where this is your x, y, z, and it's doing this. And it, but it always stays rigid like this. Now, if you're doing CFD or if you're, doing, if you're in 5227, you're going to talk about a unitary basis or a, um, um, a uh, non-Cartesian basis. And things get a bit more complicated there because uh, the, uh, not only do the, see in this case, you have derivatives of these basis vectors associated with this coordinate frame because they're change, it's changing orientation. So the direction of the unit vectors changes with time. And so if you take a time derivative of a vector that's written in terms of these coordinates, not only do you have the derivative of the actual quantity, but the derivative of the vectors that describe that, uh, the unit vectors that describe that quantity have to also be included. <clears throat> so it gets pretty complicated, right? And so my question then, or a statement, <clears throat> so it's shown here with so u is the, is the time derivative of this big X. So the coordinate frame is translating and it's rotating. So at that instant, it has some rigid body rotation associated with, uh, with it associ uh, uh, this omega, OK? At this point here, p. So there's a fluid element here. And this is the velocity at that point, And it's represented by this combination of the, of the translation, well, the, um, the velocity in the inertial frame so on the left-hand side, we have this written in inertial coordinates. On the right-hand side, we have stuff written in terms of the non-inertial coordinates. 
And they're equal because um, of the invariance of vectors. So here we have the translational uh, part of this frame. Then we have the translational part of the, this particle moving with respect to this coordinate frame, the origin here. And then we have this rigid body rotation. And if you recall, for rigid body ro rotation, the linear velocity is given by the cross product of the rotational velocity with the, displace, uh, the distance from or the uh, position relative to the, the axis here. So, so this cross product actually represents a, another type of translational term. So, so uh, it's added here also. So this is actually from the rot. This is because this <coughs> point is, this part right here comes from the fact that this point happens to occupy, or this particle happens to occupy this point in space at which the frame itself is uh, has a velocity. That point has a velocity given by this. Okay, so that's accounting for the velocity of the rotating frame itself. Does that make sense to everybody? So those are things contributing to the uh, non-inertial frame. Let me check, make sure I'm not running over. Okay. So, a lot of stuff here. And this all made sense to you when you read it the first time. Are you, are you talking about this in 5227 yet? Rotating coordinate frames? You are talking about this. So this, some of this should look familiar to you. So if we want to take the, so we get the velocity here by taking the derivative of the position, okay? So that's where this comes from. We take the time derivative. If we want the acceleration, we take the derivative again. And so now, we're taking the time derivative of this. So on the left-hand side, we have just simply du dt because it's written in the inertial coordinates. On the right-hand side, though, we got this whole bunch of stuff. So we're taking the d dt of this thing here, which is the velocity of that point written in the, um, in terms of the rotating coordinate frame, because again, we have to account for the fact that the, rotating, the frame itself is rotating and translating, and we get this right here. So, what is this term right here? Acceleration. Right, it's acceleration of the origin of this frame, right? Relative to that. But it's written in, see the thing that's, that's a little bit tricky here, and this is a hint for you, for those of you taking 5227, is that you have the option of writing the right-hand side in terms in the basis vectors from either the rotating frame, or you can write it in terms, you can convert those into the basis vectors of the inertial frame, okay? And so oftentimes when you do some of your computations, it's knowing that can help you solve these types of problems. All right, everybody stand up one more time. Some of you are, you see the whites of some eyes. I just don't know why you all don't get exci excited about this like I do. <laughs> Nothing better than some good old fluids, especially high speed fluids. I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to the high speed stuff. All right, let me sit. Anybody here a mechanical engineer? Okay, I'll, I'll keep my comment then. <laughs> Anybody here a civil engineer? Well, you know, <laughs> bridges are designed not to move. I like stuff that moves. All right, back to this. So what, um, what is this term right here, um, Mr. Where's Mr. Bright? Uh, Mr. Bright. I'm doing this to, it's my way of remembering. What is that term? It's the rate of change of the non-inertial term's rotation. Right. It's the angular acceleration of the, of the non-inertial frame. What is, uh, 
this term right here. Having taken Professor Schaub's ADCS class last semester, I should remember. But well, you should. And I'm going to tell him that you didn't. That said. <laughs> Are you working for him? No. I was about to say, I'm really going to tell him <laughs> that you're working for him. Anybody working for uh, Professor Schaub? Um, cheers. Some of, uh, you, don't, you just don't want to raise your hand. Um, Fru? Lawrence? Okay. What is that term? Okay, what is this term? It's easier. <laughs> Help him out. I assume you know the gentleman sitting next to you? I do indeed. Can you call him out by name? Mr. Harris. <laughs> I also do not know. Mr. Harris, did you take uh, Professor Schaub's uh, class? Okay. Do you feel better that you don't know it since you didn't take his class? <laughs> okay. Anybody? Mr. Sullivan, what are these two terms? Either one of them. You tell me. Okay, it's not Jeopardy. <laughs> On the far right, he said that's Coriolis. And so you're saying that this is the Coriolis, then what is this one? Who have I not called on recently? I don't know. Okay. Mr. Smith and Mr. Walker, I haven't called on you two in quite some time. Mr. Smith, he said that this is Coriolis. So if this is Coriolis, what is this? Okay, what, what is this? Okay, it's, it's not actually the acceleration of point P, because the acceleration of point P is actually encompassed in these terms. This is the actual acceleration of the particle relative to the non-inertial frame. So there's a little subtlety here in that the actual acceleration of the particle relative to the rotating frame is given by this. This is actually the acceleration of the point that it happens to be occupying at that time. Okay? So, actually, Mr. Sullivan. Oh, what are you, what are you doing looking at your notes and the book? <laughs> so, you got it backwards, right? So, this is Coriolis and this is centripetal acceleration, right? So, my question then, now that we've waded through that, is. So, observed in the non-inertial frame, the terms on the right-hand side appear to cause the fluid, fluid particle path to curve, right? And so, from Newton's first law, uh, they appear, these terms appear to cause, uh, to be, appear as effective force. Actually, I should say accelerations because we're writing this in terms of accelerations. But, but these accelerations appear to cause the path of the particle to curve observed in that rotating frame. What do we know about Newton's first law? <coughs> Mr. Watson? <coughs> okay, Mr. Watson. <coughs> okay. It's not the first law. And for an aerospace engineer, we don't say F equal MA, <laughs> do we? No. Okay. I'm only messing with Mr. Watson because I know he. <laughs> That's right. Because we build rockets and jet engines and things like that. Uh, okay. Mechanical engineers, uh, uh, yeah, you, you, you do also, okay. But F equals MA is fine for astrodynamicists, uh, but for, uh, and for civil engineers, it's just F equals zero, <laughs> the sum of F equals zero. So you imagine how bored it would be if I was up here talking about sum of forces equals zero? 
<laughs> we wouldn't have to be looking at this, right? The bridge is the bridge is there. It's not accelerating. It's not even moving. All right. So okay, I'll get off the civil engineers. Um, so, what was the point you were making? I don't know. It wasn't right. Whatever it was. <laughs> oh, I asked you which which law. It's the first law, right? What is the first law? Uh, you said you gave it to us the last time, right? So it's going to stay moving on a, its trajectory unless acted on by a force. Its trajectory? If it's going in a straight line. It'll straight line, straight. right? Unless acted upon by an external force? Yeah, or if it's sitting still, it'll stay there. Right, at rest, it will stay at rest. So in this case, we have it moving. If it's not moving in a straight line, that means some force is acting on it, right? But uh, these are these real forces? They're effective forces. OK, so he says these are not real forces. So uh, last question, last statement. So keep in mind what Mr. Watson just said. Who am I not ask a question of today? Mr. Diaz? You're next, Mr. Diaz. Because the coordinate frame fixed to the Earth is an inertial frame, in the northern hemisphere, the cyclonic, OK, I'm not trying to fool you on that. Cyclonic is counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. And anticyclonic is clockwise. Winds associated respectively with low and high pressure systems are not generated by the Coriolis acceleration. Mr. Watson just said they're fake forces. Well, effective forces. He didn't say that. I just put those words in his mouth. Oh, and I was going to sh What do you think? False. He says it's false. So so what do you what do you think? Are you saying that the Coriolis is is a real acceleration? Um, no, I don't think it is. I think it's then, then why does why do low pre what causes the low pressure and high pressure is the uh, areas? Mr. Smith. Uh, the earth is right? That's right. The earth is a rotating frame. Usually it doesn't make that much difference, you know, between if I throw something from here to, to you, you know, or even a pitcher throwing a hundred mile an hour fastball. You know, any movement of the ball that's, that's uh, perceived by the hitter is due to aerodynamic and gravity forces. But if you had a pitcher that was throwing from here to the North Pole, <laughs> it'd be a different story. The, the Coriolis uh, acceleration tends to drive uh, particles to the right of the velocity vector, right? And so that is what causes the spin up in the northern hemisphere to be anticyclonic, and in the southern hemisphere to do it the other way. Now, a question to you is, what happens with a hurricane that crosses the equator? Can it? <laughs> there, won't, there won't be any hurricanes at the equator? What, 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 is, what has happened historically when hurricanes have crossed the equator? <laughs> they disappear? Stop <laughs> rotating. And they spin away from the equator? Do they just kind of wind down and then wind up the other way? Oh, yeah. Think about that one. So this is, what, false? And this one is true. true. OK. And do a m little mind. Um, Thought experiment, you might sketch this out on a piece of paper of a merry-go-round, and then you have a kid over to the side, and one kid is trying to throw a ball to the other kid, and then sketch out what the path of the ball would look like from the kid who's on the merry-go-round versus the one who is standing on the ground. You just kind of sketch that out. It'd be an interesting little thought experiment. Yes. Are you going to upload any homework hints? Yes. Since we didn't get to it today, I will give you some hints on the homework. Uh, substantial hits. We didn't do question four. Oh, question four. Thank you. Hold on, everybody. I, I'm still going to let you out early. <laughs> Couple minutes. We got to discuss this stuff so you have a more than just know how to work problems. You got to understand the problems that you're working. 
Uh, I think so. The most general form of the deviatoric uh, stress tensor is given by this, right? Which relates each of the nine components to each of the nine components uh, of the uh, the uh, deviatoric or stress tensor. I prefer to call it stress tensor. To each of the nine components of the strain rate tensor or rate of strain tensor, SIJ. Is that correct? Correct. This allows us to write all nine components here in terms of all nine components here. Now, with the assumption of local thermodynamic equilibrium, material isotropy is far right. And stress symmetry, the 81 terms of tau ij are reduced to this. So I'm telling you that that's the case. Where the volumetric strain is given by, we already talked about that, the volumetric strain is associated with, with the uh, divergence, right? So S sub mn is equal to that. Is that correct? This is an instance where I actually intentionally wrote down a, what's wrong with that equation? There's a P top. Yeah. <laughs> the first thing I said is the tensor is equal to a scalar. Um, well, that is the thing that's wrong with it, right? All right, so uh, I will uh, upload some, some hints to the homework. I'll probably write it, do you know, something by hand. <laughs> and uh, upload that, uh, I'll do that tonight. Any questions? Yes? Is the project due before class on Thursday or is it due? It's gonna be due at 12.30.